All right, everyone, welcome, welcome to the STOA. Uh, today we have Bill uh, Torbert with us. Uh, Bill is a, a legend in the adult development leadership and organizational transformation field, and he spent his career leading, consulting, teaching, and researching a new paradigm called collaborative developmental action inquiry, um, which he applied to personal and organizational development. And he's the author of the book, Action and Inquiry, The Secret of Timely and Transforming Leadership. And his new book, uh, an anti-heroic memoir, is called Numbskull in the Theater of Inquiry, Transforming Self, Friends, Organizations, and Social Science. So uh, um, I'm super excited about uh, Bill being here. I discovered Action and Inquiry uh, in the summer, I think. And um, everything I've been reading about it feels spot on. So I invited Bill uh, to the STOA to kind of give an overview of what Action Inquiry is, and so that's how today's going to start. We're going to just have a, a jam about Action Inquiry, then we're going to have a, a Q&A, and then we're going to pivot to Bill talking about his new book, uh, and then we might have, um, yeah, we will have some breakout rooms just to discuss what was happening, then some checkout shares, so anywhere from 75 to 90 minutes uh, will be here. Uh, so that being said, Bill, welcome to Stoa, and I'm just going to take you in. Uh, uh, the Stoa is yours. Great. Well, thanks, and thanks for showing up, folks. And um, I'm very happy. I, I always like it so much better when there's no more than 25 people because then we all get to be on the same screen, and it makes it much more informal and easy to talk. And I think that uh, you should really feel free to unmute yourself and interrupt me if uh, if I've just said something mysterious or un 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 understandable. Um, uh, so, uh, how many of you? Uh, I, I'm assuming that probably um, you're not familiar with my work at all. How, how many of you are familiar with my work? Okay, so somewhat a little bit yeah so mainly i'm i'm right uh, there's low familiarity so i should start from scratch <laughs> uh, and so i will um uh, i came uh out of uh yale college in 1965 um and i wanted to be a leader you're supposed to want to be a leader when you come out of yale um but i knew i didn't know how to be a leader and so I wanted to find out how to be a leader by being a leader and, um, uh, and, and somehow researching myself being a leader. Uh, this is such an improbable idea that after two and a half years of working on it, my faculty said, no, 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 that's ridiculous. You can't do a thesis on yourself. Uh, that's totally not objective. Um, and I had been hoping that um, they would uh, be willing to read the thesis and see whether that was true or not. But instead they say, no, it's something altogether different or you're out of here. Um, and at first I thought I might go out of there um, because that was really what I wanted to do. And if they were not permitting me to do what I wanted to do, you know, a kind of teenage response to the idea. And, uh, but over a weekend, I argued myself into um, being able to write what I had been studying for two years, and I had run the Yale Upward Bound War on Poverty program for those two years and had been studying myself doing it, I could write a different book about that. It didn't have to be a thesis. Um, and for, for my thesis, I could choose something that would much more fit my faculty's view of what a thesis was, but still hopefully be uh, useful for me. So, um, the book on Upward Bound Program uh, became Creating a Community of Inquiry. Uh, and we were trying with these students who were not used to even being in school, they're usually thrown out by their um, uh, vice principals uh, because they made so much trouble. It was better to get rid of them on Monday morning um, for the week so the rest of the students could do well. Well, we thought, well, um, maybe it's our job to try to uh, create a program that is attractive to these uh, students. And um, that would probably not be by being super authoritarian about the what the program is, because that hasn't worked very well in high school. Uh, maybe um, we could collaborate on creating what we were going to do. And um, 
so we tried to do that. The first week of the program, um, uh, we went out to a camp and we tried to create the constitution for the rest of the program and the, and the schedule and how the discipline committee would work, which ended up having 10 students and five faculty, which was it's kind of extraordinary because um, here were students who could do little but scream at one another at the beginning of the first week. Um, and um, by the end of the first week, um, we indeed had developed a constitution, but not without problems. Uh, on the fourth day of the week, uh, there was suddenly a huge fight down at the lakeside during the afternoon uh, sort of free time. And the faculty and the students actually got into a physical fight with one another, which of course the faculty thought was the student's fault and the students thought was the faculty's fault. Um, and uh, we had about two hours in the late afternoon with everybody furious at one another. Uh, and we were gonna have to solve this um, because um, we made our own dinners at this at this camp and we weren't gonna have dinner unless we resolved this thing. And um, a couple of us stepped in and um, through a process that was counterintuitive to me because I believed everything should be collaborative, very unrealistic. You obviously cannot make every single decision collaboratively with other people, but um, that was what I had been more or less advocating and trying to live out. And then I found out in those two hours that by a, a real oscillation between uh, unilateral decisions by one of us or more uh, push, pushing the group into a different shape and trying to do something else with it um, and collaborative processes of conversation and eventually the faculty and students who are involved walking out of the, uh, the common room and talking to one another uh, with the help of a staff member and coming back in and shaking hands with one another, which had been viewed as an impossible outcome uh, by either the students or the faculty uh, only 45 minutes earlier. And that was the um, beginning of my learning what action inquiry is, uh, that how, how it is that you can you know, both act and inquire at the same time. None of us had any idea what to do with this. And, and it could have destroyed the program. Um, uh, so um, let, me, um, let me see here. First of all, I'll share a screen here. And um, what can we do here? Where, where do I wanna be? Maybe this one. Uh, maybe this one. So uh, that, that's the, uh, the cover of the book. And improbably, that's me standing on my head. My friend, Peter Haynes, uh, gradually did a sculpture. Uh, it took him so long, I told him I was getting too old to stand on my head. Um, and so he finally finished it. But um, here's a first picture of action inquiry, and it's uh, pretty complex. Um, so the idea is that, you know, we act, we take action, we have some kind of a purpose, some kind of a strategy, we do something, and it has an outcome in action. And then we get some feedback. The first level of feedback, single loop feedback is maybe our performance was a little off. And by a slight change in our action, we can get a better result. Or maybe, um, uh, it was way off and we need a, a really a different strategy and that's a double loop feedback. People are usually resistant to changing their strategy because, um, you know, um, we, it works out for us a lot of the time uh, and it's kind of challenging to uh, make a major change in assumptions and strategy. And then triple loop feedback um, really questions our purpose and whether we're going to, it's a sort of life or death thing just as this fight at the end of the first week um, uh, really challenged whether we would survive as a program. Uh, same thing later on, two years later, which I've already mentioned when I was told by the faculty, either change your um, dissertation completely or get out of here. Um, and it was really a question of what was my purpose? Um, 
and um, how could I digest this feedback in a way that would be constructive in some way? So, um, and what's really difficult about all of this uh, is that it, for especially the double loop and the triple loop, you've got to be able to be so present to the action that you notice that it's not going right and that uh, you don't just get defensive and when somebody raises a question about it uh, and argue against the feedback, but rather you somehow try to understand it, try to understand their point of view um, uh, and, uh, and work with it. Um, so that happened in, in the upward bound case. Um, in the end, that incident became the basis for the sense of community we had during the summer. We never had another fight anything at all, and certainly not like that. Um, and, uh, you know, similarly in my case, you know, I ended up, um, instead of leaving the program, getting two books out of it. So uh, I count that as um, having defeated the faculty, or no, 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 not, no, no, of course not. Um, so, um, there's first person action inquiry, there's second person action inquiry, and there's third person action inquiry. And all of them, and if you take those four levels that we saw before and you get very abstract about it, um, the, I contend that the world has four ontological levels. Um, the outside world, uh, which was where, where we have the outcomes of action is matter. And of course, as we know, most scientists believe that matter is the ultimate uh, element uh, of the universe, that it is the monistic source of everything. We see mind here, and we know that um, uh, the next biggest group belief about what is the basis, ontological basis of life is that mind um, is uh, the, the first thing we know, Descartes. You know, we can't doubt that we think because we are thinking when we are doubting. And so it must be the case that there's such a thing as mind. Um, but I contend that um, you, can, you can test, and all of you have done so I'm sure many times, is there an outside world really? Well, um, it's hard to doubt the outside world, really. Uh, we may be wrong about our particular perceptions, but the fact that there's something holding us up here, we're all sitting down, there's some, we're having an experience of being held up by something. And then when we try to do something, we often find that the outside world objects to what we're trying to do. So there's something out there, we don't know quite how to handle it. Uh, and we've already proven to ourselves that mind is real. Uh, and my argument is that there's two other qualities that are equally primitive and equally essential to ever being able to act well and in a timely way. And that is our own embodied awareness, which we are often embodied and not aware of it. We spend a lot of our time thinking and not remembering that we have a body. Um, uh, but to have an awareness of being embodied is necessary if we're going to get control of what we do. And if we're told that our voice is too, um, uh, too shallow to be heard in the front of the room, uh, you know, ha ha are we acquainted enough with ourselves and our own voice that we can project a larger voice into that room? It, it requires some kind of embodied awareness. And uh, similarly, uh, what can be aware of all three of these things, matter, embodiment, and mind, at the same time? And I argue that this notion of consciousness is post-cognitive. It's not the same as mind. Um, and we need to develop this post-cognitive attention in our adult life uh, if we really want to act in a timely way on a large scale, on a scale that is really not just about me and what's timely for me, but um, uh, timely for a much larger group. Uh, so that's pre I presented it kind of in first person terms, uh, but 
It can also be seen in second person terms and groups uh, in what we're doing right now. Either we're gonna have a session in which I don't stop talking and you never get a word in edgewise, uh, or um, I'm, we're gonna create a kind of a question and answer session and then go from there. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna stop and ask you what your initial reflections and comments and questions and objections are to, to what I'm saying. And I'll try to respond. I'll put this down for the moment. Oop, what have I done? What have I done to myself here? Um, so if you have any questions, just pop off mute and maybe raise your little uh, little emoji hand and it will call on you. Okay. I've got, a, I've, I've done something though to, well, here we go. Yeah, I found you again. Yeah, uh, please, anyone who wants to chime in at this point. Well, maybe I should continue. <laughs> All right. Um, so the question is, I'll go up and share my screen again. Um, where do we go here? There we were. Um, a question is how can I develop the kind of awareness that is connected to all four of these territories of experience at the same time? Your, your screen is, is not uh, sharing, Bill. Uh, Excuse me? Your screen is not, uh, I think you're sharing the wrong screen. Uh, we're looking at um, uh, files. Um, okay, sorry, I somehow, I had you all on, uh, oh, here, no, where do I get you back in my screen? Well, I'll, I'll stop, sure, sure. Here we go. Anything. Now we, now, <laughs> um, all right, so uh, the question is, how, how does one gain that kind of level of awareness in action? You're, you're not, not sharing just, your screen, Bill. You still got to share your screen. Oh, just a minute. I'd rather see people as I'm talking right now. Is that all right? Oh, oh yeah, okay. I thought you were wanted to share uh, your screen. Uh, well, let, well, let me, let's go this way. Um, uh, now, of course, you know, many people don't believe there's such a thing as consciousness, but... Um, or, and it's not a thing, obviously, it's such a quality as consciousness. Um, I imagine that's not an issue among us here, but um, I mean, how, how many of you live your life as though there is some quality of consciousness that is greater than your normal thinking, feeling, sensing? Is the, the, yeah. Uh, okay, a number of you, most of you, not all of you, perhaps. Um, uh, well, um, I want to apologize, first of all, because I've gotten into this whole talk in a somewhat different way than I'd imagined, and I'm now a little stuck, and I need to sort of relax and um, <laughs> find, the, find the starting place again. And I will try to take advantage of my confusion by saying that it's this kind of sharing that permits learning in real time in a situation. Uh, so one needs to be willing to be this vulnerable, unfortunately, um, if one is going to uh, learn at a deeper level and also if one is going to um, communicate what this is all about at a deeper level. Um, and you know we are in a in a second person situation, and so um, different ones of us uh, 
could speak in this more immediate way um, about our, our current confusion or our current um, um, assumptions about what's, what can go on here. Uh, so uh, the effort is to be aware of all three persons simultaneously. I'm being aware of myself and not just forgetting myself in my talk, being aware of you and how our interaction is going. Uh, and also being aware that we're, we're talking about subjects that are much greater than ourselves, um, so to speak. Um, one of the things I've been trying to do all my life is introduce a new kind of social science in which it's not just third person objective data about lots of people, it's also a science about how I'm inquiring right now as a first person, and also um, how you uh, can inquire more or less validly, how you can create a community of inquiry. You remember that became the title of my book um, with other people uh, that are with you and that can correct one another. Um, and, you know, I remember a time when I went to teach uh, at Southern Methodist University, a class of 400 people, and we had five faculty members, and um, we had been through a couple of semesters with 400 people, and we had one of our members had collected a lot of statistics about what the students, how much the students felt they were learning, and what kind of learning were they doing. And as we began the third session, the third semester, um, one of the things we did in the first evening, uh, besides have student groups from previous classes demonstrate uh, the projects they had done together uh, as part of their learning how to act more effectively, one of our faculty members started lecturing about these statistics, and it became very clear that the other uh, the students uh, were not connecting to this lecture and overhead. Uh, and... I realized we were losing them and I took a moment or two because it was obviously going to be embarrassing to my colleague to interrupt him. Uh, but I felt that for the greater good of the situation and despite my fear, I'd better do it. So I interrupted him and said, um, Roger, I think this isn't uh, getting through right now. I think it may make more sense to go on to uh, the next topic we had in mind. And he said, Oh, okay, Bill, that's fine. Just let me finish up here and we can go ahead. And he re went right back into um, giving a lecture on these statistics. And then I was, uh, you know, aghast, first of all, because <laughs> now it was even worse. And the idea of interrupting him a second time was even worse. But I did uh, and <laughs> yanked him from the stage, in effect, and we went on and uh, we were close enough and committed enough to giving one another feedback that he wasn't distraught about it. He was shocked, I think, but not distraught. And, um, and then when the students wrote their papers, we had them write at least a one page paper every week about experiences they had in the course. And two thirds of the papers described that scene that I've just described to you um, as being a, different from any other class they'd ever been in, and B, uh, a kind of honesty and, um, uh, you know, ability to drive uh, around the difficulty that had been created that they hadn't witnessed uh, before. So um, that's, the, that, that's the advantage one can gain, in a sense, from doing first and second person action inquiry. Um, over time, I've also done a lot of third person action inquiry, even in that course, we not only had those statistical results, uh, but um, we, had, we, we did a lot of research in the course um, that helped us to be confident that we were getting through to the students the way we hoped to be doing. Um, so, at best, you have a combination of the three types of inquiry. Or another way of saying this, another example to give is, over the years, um, we have developed a global leadership profile, which supposedly um, uh, measures 
a person's worldview or what I call their action logic, the assumptions we make about what leads to positive results, what kind of action. And um, we don't just, we have a, an analytic process which um, has been extremely successful at predicting things. And I'll say a little more about what that is later on. Uh, but we give feedback to the people who take this test about how they have scored on the test. But before we do that, we ask them to make their own estimate. We give them just a little paragraph of ideas about um, the action logics. And we ask them to um, make their own estimate. So now we have a first person estimate. Then they have a coaching session to debrief um, the score. And the coach is able, because we are training one another to do so, to be able to observe how the person is acting in the debriefing session and can thus offer a second person estimate or guess or assessment of um, what, the, what the, uh, part the, the participant's action logic is. So you, then you have triangulation with an objective third person measure an intersubjective second person measure and a subjective first person measure. So you have a much better chance at triangulating on something that um, feels right uh, to the person and therefore is useful to them. So I'm gonna say one more uh, little group of statements and then we'll see again um, whether people have questions. Um, so I've mentioned uh, this notion that people have different action logics. Um, and the, these are, uh, this idea is, is a part of adult development. Adult development didn't exist when I was running the Yale Upward Bound program. And it only began to exist about five or six years later when a whole bunch of us congregated at the Harvard Graduate School of Education uh, um, Larry Kohlberg is a well-known elder uh, in the field of moral development. Uh, Bob Keegan is somebody that people who know about adult development uh, are familiar with. Um, and several other people uh, were working on this idea um, that um, not only children develop, but also adults develop. And and as I saw it, what, what, what adults are developing toward is this greater possibility of, of being aware of all four territories of experience at once and being able to engage in action and feedback uh, in the present moment. Uh, and that the, it took time, the first action logic, the opportunist action logic, um, Oh, now I can come back to sharing the screen. This will be good. Um, um, let's see here. Yes. So these are very, very brief descriptions of the yeah. action logics. Bill, we're still seeing your um, the files. Uh, I think you might be sharing the wrong screen when you uh, uh, share. You're not sure. We're not seeing the presentation. Oh, well, that's bad. Um, <laughs> I'll, uh, I'll, I'll manage without the slides. Um, so the opportunist is often a relatively young child. Many people go beyond the opportunist level by their teenage years. But some people, notably um, Trump, for example, remain a pure opportunist throughout their lifetime. Uh, very often these people become criminals and are in jail. Um, and you do find more people scoring at that level in jail than out of it as a percentage of adults. Um, but what you're trying to do is learn how to control the outside world at the opportunist level. Can you learn how to ride a bike? Can you throw a strike with a baseball? Can you knit uh, well? Any, any kind of outward physical skill is what you're mainly concerned with learning. And then most of us, by the time we become early teenagers, 
uh, we move on to what um, I call the diplomat action logic, which is where you more or less realize, of course, you don't say these things to yourself directly necessarily, uh, but that the opportunist is creating enemies all the time and, and uh, sows uh, lack of trust. Um, and uh, it's, I guess, a better long-term outcome if you're willing to collaborate with some people or at least be a member of a group and fit in. Uh, and so what you're doing is you're working on your own behavior. You're saying, oh, I, I know that uh, this kind of um, eyeliner is out of fashion with the girls now. Um, so I'm gonna wear the one that's in fashion. Um, you're conforming, you're learning how to conform and successfully conform to groups. Of course, some people uh, go the other way and feel like they don't belong to any group. Um, and that has significant effects on their, on their future. In some ways, they're a little freer. They may be somewhat unhappy because they're not able to break into one of the groups, uh, but they're also somewhat freer because they don't have to conform to the group. So, but that's the main concern is how can I mold my own actions to be acceptable? Uh, and then in the late teenage years, especially if people go to college, um, uh, people start playing with the expert action logic. The diplomat logic has all sorts of problems with it. Uh, mainly it is that you, you, you tend to agree with the last person you talk to and other people begin to distrust you because you're not, um, you don't have any principles. You don't have any consistency. You're just trying to fit in and agree with the last thing that was said. Uh, but a lot of people spend their lifetimes in that action logic. Some people go on to the expert action logic, um, which, as you can imagine, uh, is gaining some control over the mental world, over mind. And then in their 20s or 30s, um, many people, but by no means all, a lot of people remain at the expert level throughout their life, uh, move into the achiever action logic. And the achiever is coordinating the expert thoughts the diplomat behavior and the opportunist getting a result in the outside world. They're, they're able in a regular way to plan, act, and check the outcomes. Uh, that makes them good managers. Uh, their achievers are very much prized in the organization, but they still don't have any sense, none of these earlier action logics have any sense that they are an action logic. Uh, it, it's just the way the world is. And other people who behave really differently from my action logic are just dumb or stupid or mean. Or in other words, I don't, uh, I don't imagine that the, that the difference between us could be one of a difference between action logics. Um, and it's only at the next action logic, which we call redefining, that a person begins to question all of the norms and assumptions about himself and herself and uh, other people um, and begin to become capable of questioning what's going on in a group uh, if it doesn't seem to be going in the right direction instead of feeling an immense need to uh, congregate with the group. Um, but the, the, the redefining action logic has a big difficulty because it's a relativistic action logic. You become aware other people do have different action logics and it becomes obvious, oh my God, I, how can I prove that mine is right? Um, I can't. Uh, there's no way of proving one right. Only if somebody transforms from their own action logic into a later action logic, uh, do they perhaps begin to be aware uh, that there are different action logics. And uh, then comes the transforming action logic where you, you, you become aware that you and other people are developing. So um, this whole theory is one of how consciousness develops. Um, and uh, you know, we, we shared a kind of developmental view of the universe for the last 100 or 150 years. We realized more and more how physical the universe has evolved then we began realizing how much biological life has evolved at, on earth. And um, 
then with the advent of Hegel and Marx and Freud, uh, uh, theory became developmental in nature. People realized that. Um, and now in, in the adult development theory, you're recognizing that consciousness itself is developmental. So the um, transforming action logic is one where you, where you realize you can work with double loop changes. A change in action logic is a double loop change. And you can do it by uh, uh, acting in an action inquiry fashion. And that means you have to be vulnerable to feedback because other people aren't going to be vulnerable to your feedback unless you show some willingness to be vulnerable to theirs. Uh, and suddenly you realize there's a form of mutual power. All the early action logics work with unilateral power, but you can't unilaterally transform anybody. You can make them conform, but you can't make them transform. They have to be a willing participant in the transformation. And that's what the, trans the person of the transforming action logic is beginning to be able to do that. And then finally, there's a move uh, that very, very few people um, try. And that is toward what we, what we call the alchemical action logic, which is where you are so concerned with this higher consciousness, I'll call it higher, high and low is a little uh, controversial, um, but with this later quality of awareness that begins to come up, can begin to come about, and you begin to be aware that your whole day is spent going back and forth among the action logics because you're paying enough attention to it. Um, and um, so in a sense, you're always going toward the alchemical action logic. You never get, you never get there in some sense, um, or at least I don't. Um, so um, that's the way we sort of uh, climb toward an ability to be aware of all four territories at once. Now, I have said nothing whatsoever about the third person research that uh, we've done to confirm some of these ideas. And that might be something you'd want to ask about, or of course, anything that I've talked about. Uh, now let's see if there are comments or questions or answers, or indeed, um, if you can, if you have a, an example that's popped into mind of, of some time when you received double loop feedback or offered it to somebody else and how it worked. Um, it'd be interesting for all of us to hear that. Please unmute yourself if you like and. Yeah, pop off mute or put your hand. Um, a quick question I have, uh, Bill, is um, you gave an example of uh, the opportunist uh, Trump. I'm curious if there's examples of other uh, Kind of business leaders that we would know like elon musk like where would you pattern match them in these uh, um seven different uh, stages mm. yeah um well first of all um i'd say that there's been very interesting studies of warren buffett um and we mostly most people uh, what they know about warren buffett I and mean, people here know who warren buffett is right the, or no <laughs> Um, uh, you know, he's this multi-billionaire, often the richest man in the world, businessman. And most people, the story people tell about Warren Buffett is that he's just really not a very interesting guy. He just happens to be a total genius um, about money and investing. Uh, and that he's been the same his whole life. He eats hamburgers and drinks cherry Coke and doesn't live in a big expensive mansion and doesn't necessarily drive new cars. He's just not interested in all that. All he cares about is this work. Um, but in fact, if you look much closer at him, and there's a huge uh, a biography of him called Snowball, Snowball standing for what he's taken a small amount of money and gradually snowballed it into a huge, astonishing wealth, you, you find out that he's actually been through all these stages um, he would steal stuff a lot when he was uh, uh, around 10 or 11 or 12 um, with little compunction. Uh, and then he went into a period where he was trying to find a girlfriend and he was such a, um, 
you know, uh, an intellectual in a sense uh, that he had no, he was completely awkward with girls. Um, uh, and he read, um, what is that book about making friends uh, and influencing people? Uh, this was a book that, that was very famous during the 20s and 30s. Um, and he read that book word for word and would try out the lines that the book gave him with girls. And he would keep notes on which ones were successful and which ones weren't. So he was, he was definitely an expert about everything he did, but he definitely went through a diplomat stage as well. And uh, eventually his wife became his coach in getting him to learn how to be uh, more at ease uh, with people. And uh, she played a central role in his ongoing development. But first he did business by taking companies that were near the end of their life and selling their parts off and sending them into bankruptcy. Later, he realized this had terrible effects on people and communities, it took him a little while. Um, and um, he decided he wanted to do business in a completely different way. And um, he wanted to invest in companies that were well run and he wanted to get a lifetime partnership with them. And so that's now, as you may know, um, he owns dozens and dozens and dozens of companies that all together have more workers than anybody else in the world. He doesn't run them like a CEO. He has an agreement with their CEOs that they can run the company how they wish. But if there's any problem that seems to be on the horizon, he wants to be the first one to know about that problem. Um, so it's a, it's a very laissez-faire kind of uh, managing. So he's, and, and he collaborates uh, with several other people very closely. Uh, so he's learned to collaborate. Um, so he's actually been through many of these stages. It's quite, uh, quite um, convincing. Um, and if you want to send, I think there's a, there's an uh, email for me, but we can give it at the end of the program, I guess not, but I can send you um, some paper that tells this in greater detail. So that's one person going through a lot of stages. Um, well, I'm going to jump to the very top of the, of the ladder uh, and say that um, I think Dag Hammarskjöld, who was the Secretary General of the United Nations in the 1950s for about nine years was an alchemical leader. Uh, he, I mean, people really respected him. And a lot of people have said that there's never been another secretary general that has been as effective and as visionary um, and as a sort of trustworthy, trust generating as he was. But what people didn't know uh, was that he was also a kind of a monk at the same time. Um, he had a spiritual life on a daily basis, kept a, a diary or journal which, in which he wrote poems and reflections, um, which was only found after his death and became a book called Markings, which I happened to run into in the Yale Co-op uh, the year it was published, you know, no, knowing nothing about him or anything and became an important spiritual book for me. Uh, so, um, and there's a wonderful biography of him by a man named Roger Lipsy that completely ties together his inner life and his outer life um, in a very, um, very impressive way. Uh, so that's, that's alchemical. Um, uh, there is, uh, I seem to be going down the ladder, so I'll go down to transforming. Um, there was a, a wonderful woman named Joan Bavaria uh, who started um, Trillium Asset Management, the first socially responsible investment fund back in 1980. Uh, I came to know her extremely well because um, I joined her board of directors for 20 years from 88 till 2008, when tragically and unfortunately she died um, early of cancer, um, terrible loss. Uh, in the meantime, 
She'd been named uh, Hero of the Planet by Time Magazine and won the green, uh, the, what is it called? Global Green Award or something like that by um, um, Gorbachev, um, Green Planet Award, that was it. Um, and she had grown this little firm, which all the economists and investment people laughed at when it was formed because they said, how many people are going to be willing to forego some, um, in, some investment income in order to invest in something good um, environmentally? There may be a few idealistic people who can afford to do that, but it's just not a market winner. Well, what they didn't even imagine um, was that uh, companies that move toward being more environmentally responsible might actually um, make more money than those who did not do that. And by 2000, um, it was 10% of the invest total investments in, were in socially responsible investment firms. She had not only created her own company, she had created socially responsible investing forum, uh, which helped these small uh, boutique firms uh, reinforce one another and have a bigger, much bigger influence than any one of them could. Um, she also made the company a worker owned company. So there was only a four times differential between uh, her salary and the lowest salary in the company. Um, uh, and she also scored uh, as a tra at the transforming action logic on our um, measure that I've mentioned. So um, there's a couple now I'm going to go because there's a couple hands up now. Uh, let me take further questions and we may come back to earlier action logic leaders. But um, uh, Holger? Yes, that's right. Uh... First of all, thank you, um, yeah, for for this very insightful um, presentation. I wanted to ask you. Um, I think the theory is about the individual and going through levels of um, um, more involving consciousness. How is that on a collective level? Is is in, when you look at an organization or a group? Is right. that group also going through those developmental levels, and how is the relationship? between the individual development and the mm. group development. Great, great. I'm so glad uh, for that question. <laughs> uh, first of all, the, the peculiar thing is that the way I developed this theory was that, that I first uh, came up with a theory of developmental stages for organizations because I was studying the Yale Upward Bound program. And I ended up with 143 distinct moments in the program that had some significance for the program as a whole. And I invented, with the help of Eric Erickson's theory of interpersonal development, which seemed to have some similarities to the stages I was beginning to see in the Upward Bound program. But anyway, um, so actually the organizational theory came first. Um, and um, uh, now, there's differences uh, in that, for example, an organiz the understanding is that, that individuals never really regress if they come to a later action logic. They may fall back for a time into an earlier action logic, but they still have the capacity and can kind of come to their senses and realize, oh my gosh, uh, I'm not acting like my best self here. Uh, Organizations can regress because uh, the board of directors can fire the senior management uh, or the organization can merge with another organization, which is actually at a lower action logic, but, as, but, but is much bigger and therefore pulls down the organization that was at the later action logic. But, um, and then uh, your question about, you know, how do the individual and the organizational relate um, the, the theoretical proposition is that it's impossible for a person to support or manage or lead uh, an organization at an action logic later than his individual action logic, right? Um, and this happens too with 
it, one of the most difficult things for people is working for a boss who has a lower action logic than one's own. Uh, it's enormously frustrating because the boss doesn't want to see you doing creative things because then maybe you'll get promoted instead of him or her. Um, so um, uh, the understanding is there has to be somebody or a group of people uh, toward the top of the organization that are at a later action logic than the organization and therefore uh, can have the skills and capacities to introduce those uh, to people and help them develop as leaders to the point where the organization as a whole transforms to a later action logic. Now let's, um, I'm sure I haven't fully answered, but let's uh, try whoever was next with their hand up. No, don't tell me. They, yes, Lizelle? Yes, I, I have my hand up, but I put it down because I have to go like in one minute, unfortunately. But I, I can I can throw my question out there and then I can watch it on YouTube. Um, okay. I was I was thinking as, as you were speaking, Bill, um, thank you for this. Um, it's really great to be here in your presence. Um, mm. I was thinking that John Fabeki always says like, as the child is to the adult, the adult is to the sage. And I was wondering if there's sage making abilities within this 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 um, this 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 four view. To, if if one can get this this four view perspective, if there's sage making abilities within that. Wow, I'm having a little trouble understanding what you mean by stage making abilities. You mean is there a point where a person can independently kind of uh, uh, try to get themselves to transform. Yeah, I, I think what I'm uh, what I'm is there is there uh, like the sages like like Jesus and Buddha and um, the 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 ones that the wise ones is there is this within this program is there possibility for cultivating wisdom is 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 this also a way to cultivate wisdom or well, yes, I would say yes, uh, because in my view, uh, the real measure of wisdom is the capacity to take timely action. And uh, these developmental theories of person and organization um, are stories about how um, we can take timely action to help transformational processes to occur. Um, so um, I, I think the answer to that is yes. And um, when, when also when you were talking about the examples, it became a little bit more clear to me when you were referring to um, uh, um, the, the people who were, I, I forget the name, the one who was um, UN General Secretary. Then yeah, was like, Doug oh, Hammerschold, I, yes. They yeah. they sound some sage likeness. I, I I got some taste of sage likeness when you were describing him. So yes, I think he, that's a good example of a of a wise person. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I don't I don't think of wisdom as a passive kind of quality, um, or or of having the true knowledge. The knowledge is constantly changing. Um, so, but it's the capacity to interact with the world, with other people, with an organization uh, that to me signifies wisdom. You know, and um, when Socrates drank the hemlock, um, his friends were trying to persuade him not to. Um, he was teaching them something about voluntary action and you know, how timely was it? Well, it's been remembered for 2,500 years. It's the source of Western philosophy. That action that he took of drinking the hemlock ha has had an unbelievable impact on the world. So, um, timely action. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for staying long enough. <laughs> All right. Take care. Good luck. Ron, you're going to? Ask something. 
Yeah, thank you. Uh, and just full disclosure, Bill, I, I work with uh, the LMF model and Suzanne Cook Writer, and I, I score the map instrument. So as you can imagine, I'm, I've really always appreciated your work. Uh, so thank you for that. And it's cool to have you here at the STOA. So my question is, I don't know if how much you've been aware of a lot of the recent critiques of adult development theory that have been coming from a lot of quarters. It's pretty robust in these kind of circles that we're all hanging out in. Uh, so right. I'm just wondering how much you've been tracking them and what you think of them. And if you personally are seeing a need for either the model to evolve, the theory to evolve, or how it's presented to evolve, mm. and, you know, just anything along those lines. Yes, well, there, what was the most recent one I saw a couple of weeks ago, um, and my memory is going rapidly, by the way, um, <laughs> and so I'm uh, for, forgetting uh, the guy um, who, uh, who made, the, made a series of criticisms, um, and I've already written a four-page response to that, saying that there is um, a lot of um, truth, I think, to uh, his criticisms in terms of how some people use developmental theory. Um, you know, one, he, he argues, for example, um, that, the, that it's hierarchical and elitist um, because it implies that first you go through one stage and then you go through the next. And I said earlier, we usually talk about higher stages, but we've talked for 25 years about later stages um, because it's hierarchical only in a small sense. Um, in fact, it's the early stages that use power in a hierarchical unilateral way. And the later stages, as we understand them, uh, that are concerned with mutual power. So um, you can't really be a democratic um, if you can't be mutual, and, uh, and I would say you become increasingly democratic in your understanding um, as you move uh, through the action logics. So, um, you know, I think, I, I think his, his warnings are important, and, um, but I think our way of dealing with, uh, with uh, developmental work and the fact that we have and one of his arguments is that that developmental theory is not aware of context, doesn't pay attention to context, but that's actually radically untrue. I mean, it's possible that it is true for some people using developmental theory, but the later the action logic, the more you are attuned to context uh, and to what will work here and now. So. Um, there's a great deal of concern with being attuned to uh, to context, and also to collectivities, to uh, organizational stages. But it's true that most people working with developmental theory aren't working with the organizational side. Um, so, you know, I, I I think the criticisms have some merit, um, but of course, uh, they're not really true for my way of doing it. <laughs> Uh, again, I'd be glad to try to send out that that short paper to or put it up um, on the STOA or whatever. Uh, in any way, I can be helpful with that. I'd be glad to. Yes, Daniel. I have a question. Bill, first of all, thanks for being on the show. I've followed your work for a long time, and I'm, I mean, you're, you're like a, uh, your skills are very wide ranging and your interests and your, your, like the depth and scope of your interests and your work are just amazing. So thank you for that work. I have a question. First question is if someone's at a higher level of development in, in this model, than say their, um, their manager, shouldn't they be able to adjust the situation through their own behaviors to actually bring about uh, at least movement and in, in progress, if not outright transformation. Mm -hmm. um, well, I think it is possible. Um, and um, 
I mean, I think it, take, it takes someone who pays a lot of attention uh, to the politics of development. Um, you know, one, one thing I definitely recommend is that people, you know, find people higher in the organization than the boss to form informal alliances with uh, that will help them deal with dilemmas that can help them perhaps deal with their boss. Um, uh, so that's one tactic. Um, uh, it's, but each tactic is dangerous because um, if, if the boss, I mean, you, you could go to your boss and, and ask the boss to recommend somebody later in the organization and that'll seem friendly, maybe. The boss, however, may not want you talking with somebody later in the organization. So, um, uh, and even if you just go on your own, you know, I mean, it's, it's truly wise to, you know, go, go off campus for a lunch meeting rather than staying on campus. Um, because the, the reaction by people at earlier action logics to the vibrations of the later action logics tend to be, um, they, they tend to view it negatively. Um, okay. They will feel that there's a, a, a conspiracy right. against them. Yeah. Um, and uh, so, it, 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 but I agree with you that it should be possible. Um, and, uh, but it's but, but definitely not easy. Um, in one of my books, I have a, a description of a woman um, who had been through our MBA program at BC and had been a consultant in the second year and had really gotten into the action inquiry stuff seriously. And um, in her, in the year where she was going to either be recommended for partner in her accounting form or not, she had a boss who was reputed and had special names given to him because he had never recommended somebody for um, uh, for for um, promotion. Uh, promotion. Thank you. Yeah. Um, uh, and um, she went on about how she thought it was the right way to manage her subordinates. And when he confronted her about it, um, uh, she said, "Well, your way has really worked for you." But can't you imagine um, that my way may be working for me? In fact, here's the evidence I have so far uh, that things are working, you know, doing it my way. And um, uh, he scoffed at this at first, but she kept up with it as the year went on. And uh, he did um, urge promotion for her at the end of the year. So, you know, that's, that's a case where it, it worked. Okay. And then I have another question that's really kind of out from left, out and left, coming in from left field, so to speak. And um, I'm sure you're familiar with the fellow uh, Alfred Bion group relations cool. stuff. And I'm curious yeah. about your just your general sentiment about that whole body of work and in the the, the the validity of the theory about uh, group survival. Right. Well, I absolutely loved his book, Experiences in Groups, the, his humility uh, of, of not knowing what's going on in the situation and intervening um, from, from that perspective of not knowing. Um, uh, I've been often very critical of the Tavistock movement that has grown out of his work because it seems to me that the way they run groups and conferences uh, is one in which, uh, as many of you may know about them, but they, they, the leaders uh, tend to be very silent and um, to sort of leave the conference on its own and then make um, interpretations which have a great deal of mystery around them, often uh, hard for people to understand. Um, and the leaders often claim that they don't exercise power. Um, which I think is absolutely untrue. They're exercising <laughs> a, a, a Thank very- you. High... Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, but it's still, it's still useful in the sense that um, it, it teaches us how much we're run by our subconscious. Right. And, and, and that's, a, that's an important lesson, but it's just the beginning of 
learning how to work in groups, I would say. Thank you. So um, look, there's not all that many of us, but it might be more um, engaging um, if we broke into trios for the next uh, 10 or 12 minutes and then came back at the very end, you might um, learn more from, from one another's questions and concerns um, for a little bit. Does it, would it make sense to um, divide in, into, you know, we're, we're 11 people total, but if you take Peter and me out, there's nine people. So we could have three, um, three trios. Are you willing to play with that? Yeah. Sounds good. Yeah, I see. I see enough yeses to conclude that everyone wants to know. <laughs> um, can you can you um, create these trio groups, Peter? Yeah, I'll go create them. Uh, and if you have to slip out now, feel free to do so. So, uh, um, yeah, I can make sure I get everyone in the room. Just give me mm. a mm. Goodbye, Tanya. Tanya already left. Goodbye, Tanya. <laughs> You can put one of us in one of the trios. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm. All right. So let's go for uh, let's do about uh, six minutes. Which does that sound good, Bill? Um, yeah, let's say ten minutes. Ten minutes. Okay. Any any prompt? Just kind of like riff on what has been well i think you know trying to make sense out of all this gobbledygook that we've been talking and how it relates to your life at this time cool all right so we're going to jump into uh breakout rooms all right everyone welcome back um we have some good conversations uh, Bill, uh, would you like to share any thoughts uh, from your group? Or, or you're, you're on mute. You're on mute, Bill. Bill, we can't, we can't. Uh, mute. Oh, I'd rather, excuse me, I'd uh, rather have my trio group members share. Um, uh, but I think it'd be great to hear you know, uh, what, what was moving to you in your trios or. I guess I can um, start was with uh, Amanda and uh, sort of this uh, getting a sense of what action inquiry is like, uh, like how do you actually do it? Like what's the practice of it? Um, not just sort of the, the, the theory of it. Uh, and so that was sort of a, a curiosity that was in our, our group. I can um, share a little bit about um, what I talked about, just an experience I've had in the past where um, uh, I was at school and we were encouraged to keep a learning journal uh, in order to practice action research. And the learning journal was really to document our observations of our own interior um, uh, lives as, um, as we went through this program. And the, uh, the practice was to, through the reflection, actually initiate experiments um, related to an inquiries that ideas for inquiry that came up. And, and so this is a way of practicing in, in daily life in terms of learning uh, that I really appreciated. Yeah, I guess I'll just say um, the, the lessons of um, questioning and being uh, prepared to do inquiry while I'm interacting with people is something that I'm really spending a lot more time doing. And uh, that was what I was reminded of. I had, didn't hear all of the, I haven't read the books and I haven't, um, didn't listen to the whole uh, presentation before. So I don't wanna say too much, but um, it was really an honor to be in the same little threesome with Bill. Thank you.
You know, well, one thing we talked about, and I'll, I'll defer to uh, Kevin on this if you wanted to elaborate. Kevin brought up music, and I, and I've always thought that music is a awesome metaphor for that kind of alchemical or ma ma magician kind of phase we can dip into the idea of playing well being in a jam band knowing when your part is there and uh, and you had mentioned timely action as the key to wisdom which you know I always take as it's it's so accurate but so simple it can be lost but that uh, so that timeliness with music the, the key to timeliness in music as well uh, I think Kevin mentioned he plays percussion in particular so uh, I thought that's a really good metaphor to rest on a lot of times. And we often talk about oct developmental octaves and inner octaves um, in the transition from one to the next, you can't, you sort of can go through the whole series in, in microcosm uh, of, um, of stages. Um, and I've occasionally, uh, you know, looked at events that were important enough to me um, uh, what is the exact stage in a group's development, do I think? And not just is it this stage of this, but is it two thirds of the way here, <laughs> which would make a different kind of action useful, which at least gets my imagination thinking differently uh, about what might be effective action. That's... Um... A really uh, amazing you said two thirds of the way because that's like that's like the that's the structure of rhythm is two and three <laughs> um and that structure it functions in an octave and it's got the the capacity where you can see um two patterns passing one another um but they still stay within the octave um of time um and and rhythm it is effectively the same thing as harmony hmm. um well um i'd like to make one final little statement or sales pitch um uh, if, if, uh, but if anybody else has not spoken and would like to, Esperanza, have you anything to share? Yes, I just go on with the music. Is that uh, once everyone is playing their role as well as they can, then something else happens. Something, mm -hmm. something is created that goes. Um, uh, I was going to say further than just the notes and the melodies and the rhythm. It's an entity, like a new entity. And this is what I understand um, also maybe wrongly in what you were saying is that when you get to um, a certain awareness of understanding and level of, let's say, communication, there's also the entity that uh, takes life in the in the in-between, let's say. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Something like that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I just I just wanted to to make a sales pitch for my book, this latest book, the Numbskull book. Um, it one of the things that it does is it traces my life because there came a point where I realized I was getting students to write their developmental autobiographies, and I had not written my developmental autobiography. So um, that's one of the things. I've tried to do in this book and um, and therefore hopefully to be kind of a, a guide uh, to other people in, in reflecting on their life um, and whether they see anything like this pattern uh, of, of developmental action logics. Uh, but it's also um, organized in, in such a way that um, a number of my friends have made editorial comments on on the chapters in the end notes not always kind comments sometimes relatively critical comments um, which of course have been helpful um, and then there's also uh, rather extensive appendices um, 
uh, which uh, are, are more um, intellectual, theoretical, um, trying to bring together uh, work from, from my, my whole body of work, little pieces of my whole body of work. So it's meant to be a book that isn't necessarily read from beginning to end. Um, it can be sort of opened and read for different purposes. Um, uh, so um, I'm, I'm hoping that it is more successfully um, um, in lead taking or, or allowing you to take your own lead um, rather than just conform it, conformatively reading it from beginning to end. Um, sort of choosing your way through it, practicing action inquiry as you read it, in a sense. So um, I'm really uh, grateful for this uh, talk, ability to get together today. Um, and thank you so much for inviting me uh, to Stoa, Peter. Awesome. Yeah, thank you so much, Bill, for coming to the Stoa uh, and all the good work that you do and have done. Um, so definitely check out Bill's uh, website and there's information there on how you can buy uh, Numskull. And um, yeah, the, we, we were going to have another session at the STOA on self-inquiry, but that had to be canceled, unfortunately. I was originally going to make this uh, inquiry day, but uh, maybe we'll have that <laughs> another day. Um, but there's more events coming at the, the STOA. Actually, Daniel Schmarkenberger's brother is coming um, tomorrow with uh, Ari uh, from, from the air, and they're talking about uh, all kinds of good stuff, love, orgy, and relationships. Um, so yeah, we're checking it out. So that being said, Bill, everyone, thanks so much for coming. Thank you. Bye, folks. Take Thank care. Thank you, Bill.